Bye. Good luck, everyone. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm James Doucette Battle, Assistant Professor of Sociology here at UC Santa Cruz, and I will be moderating this university forum. V is for veracity. The UCSC University Forum is an ongoing series focusing on the relevance of our research to the community and to social, economic, environmental, and political issues proudly featuring the impact of research conducted by the faculty at UC Santa Cruz. But before we begin, I'd like to share a few de details about the event tonight. We are using a webinar tool, so there is no chat function. We will have an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the program. And we invite you to submit your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Tonight's event will be recorded. In tonight's conversation, we explore the ways that Jenny Reardon will, will explore the ways in which metaphors of war and battle and fighting COVID-19, now commonplace, can have their own problematic effects on how we imagine and act in the face of the pandemic. The us versus them imagery that war metaphors promote pulls us away from veracity or trustworthy truths that foreground human and non-human relations and, inter and interdependencies. The pandemic provides an opportunity to mobilize veracity for a more just post-COVID-19 future. Jenny Reardon is a professor of sociology and the founding director of the Science and Justice Research Center at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research draws into focus questions about identity, justice, and democracy that are often silently embedded in scientific ideas and practices, particularly in modern genomic research. Her training spans molecular biology, the history of biology, science studies, feminist and critical race studies, and the sociology of science, technology, and medicine. She is the author of Race to the Finish, Identity and Governance in an Age of Genomics from Princeton University Press, 2005, and the post-genomic condition, ethics, justice, knowledge, and knowledge after the genome from Chicago University Press in 2017. 
She has been the recipient of fellowships and awards from among others, the National Science Foundation, the Max Planck Institute, the Humboldt Foundation, the London School of Economics, the Westinghouse Science Talent Search, and the United States Congressional Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Recently, she started a project to bike over 1,000 miles through her home state of Kansas to learn from farmers, ranchers, and other denizens of the High Plains about how best to know and care for the prairie. Please join me in welcoming Jenny Reardon. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, James, for that um, introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining in tonight. Um, for this talk, I just wanted to give you a few words about where this talk came from. V for Veracity was actually written um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. I was asked by um, my colleague, Alondra Nelson, to write a piece for the Social Science Research Council when it became clear that society um, was going to be greatly affected by this pandemic. Um, and I was then asked by the university to give a talk. Um, but then, un unfortunately, um, my mother died um, at the beginning of this pandemic. And um, I mentioned that um, partly because it's her birthday and I just wanted to recognize her, but, but partly to say that, you know, many of us will have lost people throughout this pandemic and, and no death um, has, is, is like really any other death. And one thing that I've been saying to my students um, as we go through this um, is that one of the things, one of the things that we can gain from this is the ability to learn from each other. And so I invite us all tonight to um, share our experiences of the pandemic. Um, and also in this moment, we really need a collective. Um, we, we need each other's truths. And I'll be talking tonight about um, how we can um, um, build towards reconstructing the collective and, and reconstructing the truths that we really do need in this moment, collective truths that we can live by. So V is for veracity. Um, so I'm going to take us back to a year ago, March 9th, 2020. Um, I took this picture. Um, this is the week the world stopped. And I took this photograph of what some of you may will recognize and remember as the Grand Princess uh, cruise liner that got stranded out here in the San Francisco Bay. Um, it, at this moment, when I took this picture, there were 340 crew and six um, for passengers not from the United States um, on the ship quarantining. As you remember, there were a lot of ships that, that couldn't find any safe harbor at this time. Um, um, we, the National Guard was called in to give COVID tests. This is right when no one knew what was happening. And on this, on this boat, 121 people tested positive and seven died. And while this affected about, I'd say 3,500 people on this ship, so many people would find themselves in this pandemic stranded without adequate information, without adequate care, and without adequate abilities for people to respond or responsibility, um, which is a formulation I take from Donna Haraway and Karen Barad, professors here at UC Santa Cruz. And I wanna to talk tonight about how we might get from the experience of being stranded on this cruise liner to a place where we do have adequate responsibility, where we do have adequate information, where we do have um, what I've been arguing we need in a pandemic, which is not just the vaccine, but veracity, collective truths we can live by. So in the wake of, of uh, you know, right at the beginning, you know, we had the National Guard being pull, uh, uh, called in. Many leaders, we had national leaders trying to mobilize their, their polities. This is a moment not in a pandemic, pan, which means you know, across the world, we saw ourselves really becoming very local, very, very much nations focused on getting their people what they needed. And national leaders were mobilizing their populations um, by saying, this is a war. Uh, this is retired British Colonel Tom Collins. This is a war, this is a war with an alien thing. Now this metaphor of war is an old one. Um, its origins um, go back to a wartime president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who um, had polio um, and uh, who uh, brought really national attention to biomedical research. Um, it, it is Delano, Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
who started the March of Dimes, which many people will know. People donated their dimes on, Del on Franklin on Roosevelt's birthday on January 30th. And this organization um, generated a lot of money and, and supported the, the, the creation of the polio vaccine, um, which was a very much celebrated um, as a, as a tremendous success of biomedicine and was likened to, to winning the war that Roosevelt also um, was uh, uh, you know, a hero for um, champion. Um, and you know, at the beginning of this, <clears throat> we now, you know, and, and one, another amazing moment of the success of biomedicine, we have another vaccine. Uh, in fact, we have many vaccines uh, for COVID-19 right now. We have three that have been licensed at least in the United States. Um, and very early in this pandemic, when I was thinking about this talk to begin with, V really had become to stand for a virus vaccine and victory. And that's how we were, well, that's how we oriented. The idea that we'd be waiting for this, this vaccine. And we got there a lot quicker than we thought. V Day came much sooner um, than anyone I think thought. This is an image from December 8th, 2020, um, the first person receiving the vaccine um, in the United Kingdom. But as we now, I think it's clear to everyone, um, you know, V really should not just be for victory vaccine and virus. Um, it's not like we ended the war and V-Day um, meant everything that we were dealing with is now over with. Um, we, we are far from at the end of this. Um, there are now, V is now for variant of these variants of concern. Um, the B117, the B1351, P1, these are all variants that now are taking off and we're now in a race for time trying to get um, vaccines to people before these new variants um, really take off, uh, for which we're, we, we um, hope the vaccines will be um, able to address. But of course, no one knows for certain um, how effective these variant, that variant or these vaccines will be against new variants. Um, but the more difficult, I think, challenge we face is that um, according to a recent poll from Kaiser Family Foundation, only 55% of Americans say they will definitely take the vaccine. And here we come to the problem of veracity or trustworthy truths. We need for um, uh, those who live in the United States, those all over the world um, to believe in this vaccine um, if, if the vaccine is going to be effective. And so it's clear that V is not just for virus variant and victory, it's also for all these other things that, that I, I, at the beginning of the pandemic, I felt we needed to be paying more attention to. And I still think are very, very important today um, and I'll be reflecting on those in the talk. V, first of all, is for vulnerable. Um, the virus has revealed as much our biological vulnerabilities as, as our social vulnerabilities. It is a biosocial event. Um, and in particular, V is for the vulnerability of our institutions of public health. This has become, the pandemic has made this amply clear. First of all, the World Health Organization that all of us, or at least many of us, I at least was following the World Health Organization back in January of last year and what they had to say about this source of critical information about pandemics. But the World Health Organization is a vulnerable institution. Um, it is not very well financed at all. It, gets, it only has budget is only the quarter of what the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and, and Prevention here in the United States, is and it's subject to voluntary funding. The dark um, aqua line you see you there is how much voluntary funds the WHO receives. And notice that number two is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So you know, in, in a large part, it is privately funding and funded, and it is subject to the whims of those private funders and at their you know at their good graces. It also has no powers of enforcement. Um, and it is easy for the WHO under these conditions to be critiqued. And indeed it has been critiqued. Um, I don't know how many will remember the H1N1 pandemic um, that occurred uh, uh, about a decade ago. Um, the fact that it was called a pandemic uh, was considered controversial and many critiqued, including the Council of Europe critiqued um, the, w the World Health Organization for declaring a pandemic. Um, in the case of H1N1, arguing that WHO did so because it was in the pockets of the pharmaceutical company, the pharmaceutical companies, which did to make a lot of funds, a lot of money off of 
the selling of vaccines. And, and indeed, in this pandemic, that has been one of the concerns that has led to lack of trust in the vaccines is a concern about is this are these vaccines there for us or are they for their there for pharmaceutical companies to be making money? And that was certainly was an issue raised in, in 2009 with H1N1. And then this time around, the WHO is critiqued for being too slow, for being in the pockets of China. Um, which people argue was trying to cover up this pandemic and the WHO was complicit. My point is that this institution is vulnerable to critique um, and, um, and it, is, it also is vulnerable because it's trying to do uh, science in what, what we call in the sociology of science post-normal um, times. Um, this is a ref I'm not going to go into detail. I'm happy to talk about this in Q&A, but this is a reference to Thomas Kuhn's argument about normal science. Uh, but some features of post-normal science is, um, and these are points that were also brought forward by Ulrich Beck, Beck a sociologist, um, in a German sociologist who wrote this book, I should say, right after Chernobyl, the Chernobyl accident. Chernobyl nuclear power was supposed to be a way to turn the deadly force of physics into a positive force um, by harnessing the atom not for death but for energy. Um, yet then we had Chernobyl and Beck ceases, uh, you know, and actually this is the point that is more generally made in science studies, which is as collectives as we turn to science and technology to mediate more and more of social li life, to ask it to answer more and more of our social problems, science enters areas that are inherently political and uncertain. Science cannot tell us what's gonna happen with a pandemic. Um, in large part, that depends on human behavior, which is not something that is easily predicted and is subject to political and social um, mediation as we've found through this pandemic. And second, um, science then is in the position of not just addressing environmental issues, not just addressing biomedical issues, but of creating um, uh, problems as well. Um, and environmental risks become the primary product, not the side effect of industrialization and science becomes a major driver of industrialization. So in this case, the very, um, vaccines that we are receiving from Pfizer and Moderna are made by this new technology CRISPR, which also has these other risks associated with it that were made evident by the CRISPR baby um, um, issue two, year, two years ago when it was used to edit the human germline in ways that was condemned um, by the, the broader scientific community. Again, we can get into that later in the discussion, but to say that there are two sides to science um, that it both addresses social problems and creates new ones at the same time. So how do we handle that? Um, and this is happening at the same time that science and industry are completely entangled. Um, you know, these days, if you're a good scientist, I, the argument is made by top leading scientists that to be a good scientist means to have a company. Um, this it means that you're relevant if you have a company, if you have venture capital. Um, and, and that means we have these entanglements that mean we can no longer say we have the space of pure science and we should trust science based on the fact that it is apolitical, because of course it is political when there's money at stake. So how do we address this? And this means that the old problem of trust, there's always been problems of trust when it comes to science are intensified um, in the contemporary moment. Okay, so these, and, and WHO is trying to work in this space and it's vulnerable to these critiques, which we have not figured out a way, I would argue adequately as a society, a way to respond to these realities um, without then saying we shouldn't trust science because we should, but we also need to address the, the social and political dynamics that are at play in science and have a way to talk about that. So the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention is also vulnerable. Um, its uh, funding has been greatly cut. Um, it, it, um, it was a source of multiple failures in the course of this pandemic, most notably to begin with. It's the reason why we didn't have tests early on. It didn't follow its procedures properly. It produced a contaminated test. For weeks, this nation had no adequate COVID-19 tests. Um, you even had, um, you know, a, the, the, new, the, jur the, the magazine, The Atlantic, um, uh, Alex Madrigal and others coming in to fill the void, creating their own COVID tracking 
um, project to um, uh, to create data about what tests were. Not only did we not have tests, we didn't have good data about who was taking the test. And you saw uh, journalists, um, which is actually they've been some of the heroes, I think, in this pandemic, filling that gap. Um, and this is partly because we've seen this drastic decrease in expenditures into um, our federal public health infrastructure in this country from 1970 to, uh, to today, dropping from 50% of, of um, uh, federal, federal government's share of public health expenditures fell from 50% to 15% over this period. And so as a result, and what has happened is that the federal government has, has spent its money not on public health, not on, but instead on investments in the future of health through investing in things like precision medicine and biomedical research and not present health needs, not on public health. And so it should not surprise us that there was no federal response. This should not be a surprise. Um, when you don't put funding into something, it's not surprising that it doesn't have the capacity to respond. And what, how does that play out on the ground? Um, you see San Francisco, um, this is also a photograph I took early in the pandemic, um, was doing its own PPE drives, um, getting its personal protective um, equipment. Um, and so, yeah, everyone was, it, and states were, were, were um, you know, vying for each other to get, to get supplies. It was, it was crazy town during those few months, as you might remember, of people just scrounging around for whatever they could get. Um, now, on the flip side of this, when we have invested in public health, we do see um, results from this. And, and San Francisco, um, I think, was the, the, the city that did the best in this pandemic. And that is because of its historic investment in public health. The Lagoon de Honda Hospital and Rehabilitation Center, a very large um, uh, nursing care facility that houses over 800 people. Very, the, 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 the employees there are well paid. There's enough of them. They did not have to move from, from hospital to hospital, which is how the, how the, the virus was able to travel as we underpaid our healthcare staff who then had to work in multiple places. That didn't happen here because of the investment in public health. And this San Francisco has seen the lowest rates of COVID anywhere in the country. Um, so V is also for vulnerability of infrastructures of information. Um, so we have seen how social media makes us vulnerable to misinformation. Uh, in this pandemic. Um, this was true before, of course, but heightened by the pandemic. Um, a lot of information we were saying needed, it, it need, everyone wanted to get a, out quickly. They were putting on their Twitter accounts. It wasn't going through peer review or scientific journals. As, um, that wasn't the primary place it was going up to begin with. We didn't have time for that. Um, and these systems are vulnerable to misinformation. I'll give a couple examples of this tonight. Um, but even when the misinformation is taken down off of places like Facebook and Twitter, it somehow found a back door. And this is an example of how the Wayback Machine, which is an archive for the, for, for the internet, um, started to be a source of mis misinformation. It was caught up in the, in the Trump bleach claim. When Trump made his claims about bleach and Facebook and, uh, took it down, then um, um, sources of, uh, sources turned to the Wayback Machine and just pointed people to, to the Wayback Machine's website. And then the Wayback Machine had to started using these yellow banners as well. Um, Biomedicine, it also very, it's an institution that we turn to for information this pandemic, also vulnerable because it also is caught up in this cycle of of, of trying to be wanting to get out front on the media, having the hot take, um, and also vulnerable to being privately funded and subject to funding. This is um, the case of JetBlue co-founder um, funding the Stanford study, which you might remember, right when we were wondering how exactly deadly was this virus and how 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 fast was it spreading. Well, um, you know, JetBlue uh, had an interest in, in, uh, in, in the answer to that being um, actually a lot more people than we think have had it, and thus the death rate is much lower than we thought. And so um, they fund this study, and which is led by, by a very prominent um, uh, professor at Stanford University, the CF, CF Renberg Chair in Disease Prevention and Disease Prevention at Stanford University. 
And on April 17, they, the, the, the group at Stanford publishes a preprint that claims that the infection rate is 85 times higher than believed. And so the death rate was really just the rate of like the average flu. And so we shouldn't all be staying home. This is nothing, nothing to be that concerned about. And even before that, um, the lead on this, on this uh, uh, study appears on BBC, CNN, and Fox News, um, you know, getting out there in the media um, um, uh, with this without, before it was vetted by the scientific community. He, there were colleagues at Stanford who were, who were raising the alarm saying we cannot validate this test for the antibodies. We don't think this test is working. And now we know that actually these antibody tests are very hard to, to, um, uh, to get to work properly. Um, and, but nonetheless, despite the fact that his colleagues were raising these concerns, it was published and put out on preprints. And you know, I just wanna note that there's a long history of ties between Stanford and JetBlue and these entanglements matter. Um, these forces, these pressures, they matter and our scientists are also vulnerable to them. Um, in general, this is a great article written by Ed Gong, um, who's done some great journalism throughout the pandemic. Science itself has been vulnerable. It both won, it both is a hero, it brought us the tests, it brought us the vaccine. But I think this title is very apt, is very apt how science beat the virus and what it lost in the process. Um, and uh, the, 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 the case of Stanford and uh, the Stanford study exemplifies this, the decrease in standards, the increase in retractions, Stanford had to retract its, its, its findings, leads to an erosion in public trust in science. We also saw that much less attention was given to other critical areas of research. 80% of clinical trials stopped and field research in critical ecological uh, areas, bird counts, et cetera, stopped. Um, so we lost a lot. We gained through putting our focus on COVID and science and we lost. Um, and in ways that uh, displayed some of the vulnerabilities that, that the institutions, our institutions of biomedical science have. Our ecosystems are also vulnerable. Something I think that has not made it as much into the news as it should have. Um, the pandemic, as Kate Brown put it in this article, is not a natural disaster. It was produced by cutting down the ecosystems in which bats reside, bringing humans in much closer contact with them. And they are, I, I can't go into the biology of this, but happy to, to go into how this, these zoonotic diseases happen where they jump from one species to another. Sufficient to say that habitat destruction is part of what created the conditions for this pandemic to happen. B is also for violence. And I think this became very clear to us um, in the middle of this pandemic with, with the George Floyd murder. And what this pandemic has made clear is some of us die at a, at a higher rate or subjected to structural violence more than others of us. Um, and this pandemic has shown a bright light onto this. We all know that our frontline workers are very disproportionately non-white. One thing we may not know that is even in sectors of the healthcare, uh, uh, healthers, uh, healthcare sectors where it's predominantly white, um, the people who did not have access to PPE or personal protective uh, equipment were predominantly non-white, which is what this graph is showing to you. Um, also, um, the, this pandemic, like other many other diseases that have come before it, um, people are not just dying because of the virus, but from the pandemic of racist or sexist signification that surrounds the virus. Um, we are now seeing many people in, um, in Chinatowns and Koreatowns across this country being subjected to violence, um, something that um, this is, um, again, Kong, um, writing this article um, um, in, in the New York Times uh, over the weekend, we need to put a name to this, uh, to this violence. Um, and, and the relative invisibility of, of the deaths of Asian Americans um, uh, in this country and in this pandemic. Um, and Ruha Benjamin, early on in the pandemic, uh, put this very well when she said, the virus is not simply biological, but biopolitical. It may not set out to discriminate, 
but the structures in which it circulates certainly do. And this is an argument that Paula Treichler made decades ago about in the, when, with the AIDS pandemic, that people were dying as much because of how we talked about and represented the disease, presenting it as a gay disease, um, as they were dying because of a new biological virus in our, in our systems. And V is for visibility, as Arundhati Roy made evident in one of the, one of the early pieces on the pandemic, um, when she argued, look, who is visible in this pandemic? You tell us that we should all go and stay home, um, but how were, were folks, or all the migrant laborers in India supposed to get home? These are images of people stranded having to walk because there were no buses. The country did not have a plan for them. Their plan worked for people who could easily stay home, not for people for whom it was going to be actually a long bus ride to get home. So who is visible to our polities, to, our, to the people who are making the policies? And there is a long history of diseases and lives being rendered invisible um, by diseases. Um, starting with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who kept his polio um, invisible, um, and then, of course, very notably um, with the AIDS crisis, um, this is um, David Wojarnowicz's um, uh, uh, image. He was a, a wonderful activist and, um, and, and uh, uh, activist in the AIDS epidemic. Um, if I die of AIDS, forget burial, just drop my body on the steps of the FDA. The FDA at that time was refusing to recognize this disease and put money into it. The national government was refusing to recognize it. Um, and I think one of the issues with trust in this pandemic is a lot of people have been saying, look, you know, we, we've been dying for all kinds of reasons and you're not paying attention to us. Um, and so, you know, so, so, so this long standing lack of attention, this invisibility um, has been a real factor in this pandemic in, in, in generating trust. Um, this who is visible, the visibility question also arose very early on as, um, as, it, as it became clear that we didn't have data, we didn't have data on race and ethnicity during the first three weeks. Many of us who, who are in the field that I'm in were wondering about this, like where was this data? And this piece, this op-ed came out in the New York Times um, uh, in which the uh, chief health equity officer of the AMA called for the production of, of, of data about who was dying. And I wanna note that what he says is, look, our call for the reporting of racial and ethnic data is not based on a poisonous argument that some races are more susceptible to the coronavirus. Our call instead is based on widely known history that American health institutions were designed to discriminate against blacks, whether, whether poor or not. Unfortunately, early on in the pandemic, uh, many commentators started to talk about how African-Americans were more subject to, to COVID-19 because of underlying conditions, which made it sound like there was some pathological, biological reason for why they were more subject. Um, and this is part of that pandemic of signification I was just talking about in the previous slide. So it's this collective lack of attention to these Vs, vulnerability, violence, and visibility that produces what I argue is our largest challenge in this pandemic, which is producing veracity. And V ought to be, I think, particularly now, um, standing for not the vaccine, but for veracity, which we desperately need if we are going to bring this pandemic um, to a close. So this is, the, this, is, this is the article that I originally wrote way back at the beginning of the pandemic. And there, you know, I, did, I, I note that veracity derives from the Proto-Indo-European root vero meaning true or trustworthy. So it, in that word um, signals that truth and trust, uh, truth one cannot be had without the other. They are intrinsically entangled. So we have, of course, a big trust problem with the vaccine, which has been widely talked about. Um, largely, the focus has been on 
um, non-white people of color's lack of trust, but I wanna start with Republicans' lack of trust because that is as much a source of lack of trust in the vaccine as anything else. And this shows you the number of, 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 of Republicans who say they're, 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 they say, no, we're not gonna take this vaccine. It's 41%, it's very, very high. Um, and this is a fairly recent poll and it doesn't seem to be coming down. And I think this is due to this, uh, a culture of individualism in the United States. I'm from Kansas. When I had to go back home to deal with my mother's estate, uh, hardly anyone was wearing a mask there. And there's very much a, you know, we do what we want here kind of attitude. Um, and also a long legacy of the culture wars. You biomedical experts, you're these elites on the, you know, on the west, on the west, on the coast. Um, you know, what do you, why should we believe you? Um, this is not good if you want to be um, bringing a country together to deal with a pandemic. The systemic political problems of our country are not playing out in the bodies of our people. Structural racism also undermines trust. And I wanna say, and access, because we've been focused on this question of whether or not um, people of color, particularly African-Americans trust the, the vaccine, citing things like Tuskegee and previous abuse by the medical system of African-Americans, which is important. However, we don't actually know because we don't have the data exactly why we're seeing these numbers. So here are, we have these numbers. So, and this is in Dotary County um, in, in Georgia, which is where I was born, um, showing the vaccination rates. Um, and this county is 60% Black or African-American using census categories, census categories and 38% white. And despite that the fact that there are, there are far more Black or African-Americans in this county, they represent only 4.3% uh, of who has been vaccinated with whites, so 11.1%. So what accounts for the difference? I think it's been easy to say that this is mistrust of the vaccine, but, but it could also, what are we, we don't actually have that data. Um, what does data about lack of trust not reveal? We're, we're, we're asking people whether or not they trust the vaccine, but we don't know whether or not they actually have access to it, which is a point that Susan Reverby makes in this article that was just published yesterday um, in PLOS Biology, where she's pointing out that there are, in, for, many, um, for many people, getting the vaccine means going to a drugstore. And just like we have deserts when it comes to grocery stores, like communities where there aren't drugstores, we also have communities where there are not grocery stores. We also have many communities in the country where there are not drugstores. And so how easy is it to access these um, uh, vaccines? I, my, myself, I've been on, I've been getting on the, we're eligible here in, in California uh, as university professors. I get on, I get up early in the morning, I check online. Um, I did that for two weeks before I found an appointment. Who has the capacity to do that? Um, v is also critically, if we're gonna turn this around, has to be for values. Um, and at the moment, it still looks like the value of intellectual property um, dominates. And uh, Moderna is the only company to date that has come forward um, and said it was not going to enforce its intellectual property rights around um, the virus. Um, the other two companies, Johnson & Johnson um, and Pfizer have not made the same commitment. Um, uh, the, the WHO's effort to create this, um, what was been called CTAP or the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, which is asking countries to make commitments to share resources. The United States still has not joined this. Um, this there's a long history of, of people arguing that we must protect intellectual property if we're gonna get things like vaccines. Um, and um, that is a major obstacle for us in producing veracity. People see the pharmaceutical companies, and rightly so, um, as uh, interested in um, intellectual property and in profit. Um, so we also need to attend to the ways in which values embed are the very data we're being presented about COVID-19. Um, if we're going to increase trust in, um, in the data that we're putting out there. So how did this become the dominant disease model? We're all familiar with this, the famous uh, uh, the graph, or many of us, I, I should say, are, are familiar with this. this. This graph became famous. It came out 
Um, this is the Ferguson study um, that was put out uh, by UK academics very early on in the pandemic, showing that what would happen if we did not go into lockdown. Um, so that black line will show you, um, you know, what would happen if there was no lockdown. Um, and it was showing that we would get past the capacity of hospitals to, to deal with COVID-19. And as a result, we saw a, um, as a, this is what is largely credited for um, the lockdown policies we've all been living with um, for the last year. But what are the assumptions and values that are built into these disease models? Um, uh, my colleague, Carlo Kadef was working on this very early on in the pandemic. And um, I remember early conversations with him about this piece and how difficult it was to actually articulate these ideas at that time. Um, you know, he was really going against the grain and saying that this, these, this, this some seemingly objective uh, graph presumes that there's this pandemic solidarity out there and we all face a universal danger. But of course we weren't all gonna be experiencing this pandemic in the same way. Some people would be able to stay home and that would save lives. For other people staying home would lead to people dying because they didn't have access to food. Um, they didn't have access to critical care. And we saw this though being promoted, this idea of a lockdown being promoted um, and, you know, he argues because of the constant media sensationalism, deep authoritarian longings, increasing political pressure to contain the spread of the virus, but most importantly, a trust in the power of mathematical disease modeling. And remember what I had to say about the failure of investment in public health and how early on the FDA did not have a test. So we couldn't do what Korea did and do test and trace. Um, we had no tests. So in a way we had, we, in the absence of any data, early on I remember saying, you know, we no longer live in an era of big data. The pandemic is the era of no data. We didn't have data from these tests. And so in the absence of robust data, disease modeling emerged as the presumably best and only available science to inform the foreign policy. But what were the background values that led to that being the case? Values that led us to invest in biomedical research and not public health. Um, values that led us to, um, uh, to not invest in our public health infrastructure. And I think it's important for us to recognize that. We need to ask whose lives were we valuing um, here? Lockdown without adequate systems of support simply locked out too many. And it hid from view the structural problems created by undervaluing public health, um, e.g. no tests, no data. Okay, so the last part of my, my talk is really gonna focus how we turn this around. And here I wanna start by asking, how do we create responsible data? That is a data that's able to account for its own values, what it allows us to see, what it allows us not to see, and why we've made those choices to shine our light on certain elements of the world to produce data about certain things and not other things. So how do we create data that can help us respond to the deeper problems of equity and discrimination revealed by this pandemic? And at UC Santa Cruz, we've been asking that question, how do we train a future generation of scientists and engineers to see and respond to the moments where questions about data collection and analysis meet questions of justice? And we have started at Santa Cruz this, this this, I think, unique program, the Science and Justice Training Program, the only training program I think that we know about in, in the nation, indeed in the world, that focuses on issues of justice. There are many biomedical ethics programs, um, but there's none that focuses on justice. And by turning our attention to, to justice, we're not interested in things like individual informed consent or whether or not a scientist, you know, fudge the data. We're not focused on what individuals do and whether or not they get things right or wrong. We're interested in the collective good and how we create a science that orients us around the collective good. And I think that is what's unique. Um, and I just wanna call out the training program that's having its decade um, anniversary, 10 year anniversary of the program. Um, it's taught 91 graduate students from 22 different departments across all five um, divisions of the university. Happy to talk more about this in the discussion. Um, and um, 
you know, it's also issued 35 certificates to students who've done projects, um, some of them in biomolecular engineering, some of them in physics, some of them in anthropology, some of them in philosophy, that are innovating methods for how we do this kind of work of shining a light on where questions of knowledge and questions of data meet questions of broader societal um, um, good and questions of ethics and justice. Um, in that program, we're training students how to see and respond to a more diverse range of lives. So I want to um, um, remind us and, and, and focus on this point that Kate Brown made that the coronavirus isn't just a public health crisis, it's an ecological one. Um, we, in order to uh, address this pandemic, as I said, um, we need to be thinking ecologically about what led to it. Um, so it is not just a case that uh, this is about what humans do. It's about recreating our creations with humans and non-humans and thinking about how we coexist with these viruses. Um, not thinking, oh, what we're going to do is when one spills over to us, we're going to just like knock them out and kill them. But how do we coexist with them so we're not put in the place of, of needing to eradicate them? And so V is for valuing other forms of knowing, biological ways of knowing, ecological ways of knowing. So if any of my students are part of my class um, on here today, they're gonna know that in my, in my senior seminar, um, you, you've gotta learn some biology. This is a piece by Scott Gilbert, um, developmental biologist, colleague, wonderful colleague who wrote this piece um, that was published in the Feral Atlas that um, Ana Singh and others on our campus um, uh, just published that makes the argument that, you know, it, it, organisms live in, in, in ecosystems and how they, what effects they have depends on the context in which they um, exist. So the coronavirus, not a problem for human beings, as long as they were this new one, COVID-19, as long as it was hanging out in bats. It's only when the ecological shifts happen and they move that it becomes a problem for human beings. Um, so we live in this much more complex, this is a representation from 1894 of the ecosystem um, of a nematode, uh, 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 this ecosystem that includes nematodes, ciliates, and segmented bacteria and fungal species all living together. We need to be thinking ecosystem wide and we're part of that ecosystem and how do we live with, with together. Um, v is for virtue. Um, how do we orient, we can, we can, we, we do need to attend to our values, but values like intellectual property don't necessarily lead us to the collective good. So how do we orient towards the good? Um, and I, first and foremost, for that to happen, I think we have to ask, who is the we? Um, that, that is the, the fundamental question that always needs to be asked. Who do, our, um, who do our institutions represent and serve? And through this pandemic, we have found ourselves having to ask that question, whether or not it's law enforcement agencies or our institutions of public health. And I'm just gonna focus here on what I know best, which is in the science arena and which bears upon this pandemic the most. And so who are we in the life sciences becomes an important question. Um, I started off my career in the life sciences. I was one of these women in the life sciences early on. But what we see is while we've increased the number of women in the life sciences in, 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 in as who, are, who go on to become graduate students, um, and even those who go on to receive their PhDs, what we have not increased are leaders in the field. Um, in the labs of male Nobel laureates, which tend to be feeder labs, what are called feeder labs for who gets these, these plum positions in universities like UC Santa Cruz, um, two to one male to female ratio still today, three to one male to female ratio of postdocs. Who are we in the life sciences still very predominantly um, male leaders in this field? Um, I'll skip over the HHMI, but also uh, same trend. Uh, black representation in STEM, where we have, um, where, where we see that 13% of the general population, but only 5% represented in doctoral degrees in, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math in the United States. How are we gonna change this? 
we desperately, desperately need to move, I would argue, beyond an inclusionary approach. It's not enough to say we're going to put money into fellowships, we're going to bring different kinds of people into our university. Um, we also have to transform these universities. Um, and indeed, if we just include different kinds of people in our university, it can hide structural problems that need to be addressed. And I just want to make a call out here um, to um, um, grad students at the Molecular Cellular Biology Department at UC Berkeley, who I just had a chance to meet with last week, and this incredible work that they're doing at their department to shine a light on these issues and to, and to look at what the structural issues are that need to change. And these changes are at the level of, of cultural values and practices um, that need to change in order to make space for different kinds of ideas about how to do science and what kinds of questions should be asked. Maybe so that we could reorient, so we put more of a focus on ecosystem analysis and, and we're, we're, we are not in a position where, where we're waiting for molecular scientists to save us with a vaccine. Um, in order for that to happen though, we can't just wait on our grad students to push us. Um, we've got to, leaders in science and in higher education have got to have to champion this transformation of these fields. Um, right now, our grad students are doing incredible work pushing us uh, to make change, but that change also must come from the top, from leadership. Um, and I wanna cite one example of an effort to change by providing different types of training. This is a summer internship program for indigenous peoples that my colleague, um, Kim Tallbear has helped to uh, form. Kim Tallbear, who is an alumni of UC Santa Cruz. And this is a, a program that does not ask indigenous peoples to leave their values at the lab door, but to bring those values right into the lab and to reshape the kinds of questions being asked by the field. And um, we need to do this because um, you know, we need to also reinvest in a, in a decade long erosion of commitments to institutions oriented towards collective good. Um, uh, we've seen, um, uh, uh, and, and I, I would include universities in this as a question mark. Do universities still represent the collective good? It's a question we have to ask because as institutions, we've also been vulnerable to being captured by um, the interest of private interests by pharmaceutical companies. And we have to be asking ourselves, what are the values that are shaping our universities and driving them? And is the collective good um, um, an underlying an underlying value and who is the collective and what is the good. And too often we succumb to slick critiques and fancy presentation of alternatives. We critique these old institutions for their old ways and we've we've gotten into a kind of startup culture. And I think you know the Philly finding COVID case is a good example of this where you had a startup 22 year old startup who sold the city of Philadelphia this idea that they could get the vaccines out and it turned out that they didn't have the capacity really to do that. And that is also what's undermining trust. So after the hype, after we've like bought the bill of goods, what's going to remain? We need durable institutions that can remain. How do we reconstruct any sense of a collective? And here's where I want to end with a few ideas about this. So um, and again, a reminder about without a collective, there can be no veracity, no trustworthy truths. So off the cruise liner and into the collective, how do we do it? A few final thoughts. First of all, orienting towards non-human, let those bats go. You know, let's learn how to live with these bats and not have them gripped in our clutch, waiting to, you know, um, make sure that we can like contain them. But how do we live with them? Um, how, better understanding of their needs, their ecological needs, their needs for care. Um, orienting towards what my colleague Anna Frizz has called the broad now. Um, instead of this biomedical, uh, our, our tendency to be speculating about the future. Um, biomedicine tell, is a lot about what's gonna happen in the future. We're gonna be able to do all these things with our new mRNA technologies. But instead of speculative futures, how do we work with speculative forms of the present to investigate more deeply in the present for how to be in the world today. 
um, instead of about thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow, what about the vast capacity that we have today to make the world a better, more inhabitable place for a more diverse set of lives? So as Professor Fizz, um, who's in the UC, in our, in our faculty of film and digital media has put it, instead of a deterministic futurism enabled by technological progress, how do we favor a surplus of present delving more deeply into this expanded conception of the present to recognize other existent relationships and ways of being. And this is an image um, from work that she's doing in the Atacama Desert in North Chil Northern Chile, where we've been, um, this is where a lot of the Mars rovers have been tested out. This has been considered, you know, a kind of wasteland, a, a land also where we mine lithium. Um, but there's so many um, things going on on this land, so many possibilities, so many ways to envision how we live on it. Um, there is a broad now of possibilities that um, instead of thinking about the future when we go to Mars, how about today on this land? So we've been focused on articulating the broad now in, um, in science and justice over the last year through our Pandemicene podcast that we've been doing. Um, the first one that we did, we've been interviewing members of our community about how they're responding to the pandemic. The first one we did was with our colleagues, Kim Talbear and Jessica Kalapenik. And I just want to um, um, you know, uh, quote uh, Professor Talbear here um, about the importance of developing new kinds of ways of speaking, new languages. So not the war metaphor, but a new way of talking. And she says, it's really hard for us to think better ways of living together in a language that is so incredibly violent historically and so built around binaries, moral absolutes, good and bad. It is so baked into the English language that we use. New languages open up a new way of seeing the universe. And she just said, once you know how to say something, maybe you'll know how to act differently. It broadens your imagination to do that. So this is one thing I think we've been really good at at UC Santa Cruz. Um, Kim Talbear is, a, is an alumnus here. She worked with Donna Haraway, who is a professor emeritus here of history of consciousness, a person who's inspired so many of us to, to, to use language differently, to thereby think differently. And so just to call out to the importance of Donna Haraway's work um, to, this, to our ability to imagine new possibilities. And so how do we live in the broad now in collaboration with if addressing that non-binary non problem in collaboration with non-binary non-humans? This is a call out to Paloma Medina's work. She wrote, uh, she did, she was a part of our training program. Um, she produced a, 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 a book along with um, her artist colleagues, Karen Ross, Audrey Ford, and Je Je Jessica Kendall Barr, where she, she, take, she looks at how clownfish transition, you know, we, we know about these clownfish from um, Finding Nemo, but what we didn't learn in Finding Nemo is that clownfish will transition from male to female. And so she uses this and, and puts this, brings this into, they, Paloma, they, they, they bring this into our understanding of the biological world that there are non-Barrett binary. We're not just she's and he's, but we, we transition across these boundaries. And, um, and finally, we must orient towards justice, which is something we've been doing in the science and justice program. Again, this means orienting not towards individuals, but towards the collective. This is um, Ian Carbone and Der Derek Padilla who have, um, uh, who develop these greenhouses um, that um, take the, the sunlight that, uh, that the plants don't use and use it to generate power in greenhouses. Greenhouses actually Gener they, they guzzle a lot of energy. And so these two physics students um, who worked on new material technologies wanted to not build these greenhouses for large corporations, but figure out if they could prototype for small farmers. Um, and there's more I could say about that, but this is like, we need to do, we need to make a different kind of technology that embeds a different kind of value that, that, that orients us towards, towards the good. And I'm gonna end here with um, a quote from where I began, Alondra Nelson, who's, who invited me originally to write this essay and who since has been appointed the deputy director of the Office of Science, Technology and Policy. I end here because this was, a, a, when I talked about the need for leadership from the top, 
I think many people have recognized her appointment as the first deputy director of science and society in the Office of Science and Technology Policy as an inspired choice, as a sign that there is leadership from the top that is trying to orient us towards justice. We've never had someone in the Office of Science and Technology Policy whose mandate was to look at social justice issues, but Alondra Nelson was just appointed to do this. And I wanna end with her words. I believe we have a responsibility to work together to make sure that our science and technology reflects us. And when it does, that it reflects all of us, that it reflects who we truly are together. This too is a breakthrough. This too is an innovation that advances our lives. There has never been a more important moment for scientific development to get scientific development right or to situate that development in our values of equality, accountability, trust, justice and trustworthiness. Absolutely, this is a moment, this is an opportunity orienting towards justice so that we can build truths that are worthy of a collective belief, which is what we desperately need to end the pandemic. And so just a final word of thanks to everyone who's made this work possible. Colleen Stone, who doesn't, without which we couldn't do anything at Science and Justice. James Battle, who, who has been working alongside us throughout all this, keeping us going and inspiring us. And the Pandemi team, um, who, who ran that, that podcast I told you about, special call out to Issa Ansari, Katia, um, and Mariam, and as well as Dennis Brown, and Paloma, and, and Lucia. And with that, I open to questions. You're muted, James. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for such a rich presentation. Brings up much reflection and many questions. Um, I'd like to ask you before I go into the chat box, the war against polio signaled the rise, the ascendancy of the United States after World War II. Could it be said that the war against COVID signaling the ascendancy of China? Mm. And does the violence against Asian Americans signify um, and, and the distrust against the vaccine, does it, do they signify a certain decline of, of American global power? Well, certainly that's one of the dynamics um, at play here. Um, China has been pushing much more so than the United States, global access to the vaccine. Um, and despite the early um, perceived, you know, and I believe, you know, the, the, the desire of the Chinese government to, to not be completely transparent about what was going on, um, they certainly have been pushing to be leaders in, in global health um, in a way that the United States has not been pushing to be a leader in global health um, as signaled by Trump's uh, drawing out of the, from the World Health Organization during his presidency. Um, I do think we're seeing a geopolitical struggle playing out over the pandemic and, um, and, and people are sensing that. And um, that is part of why it's hard to be believing. We saw this most evidently with Trump. And notice I didn't say a lot about Trump in my talk. And, and there's a reason for that. I think we overplayed um, Trump's significance in all of this. Trump, I think really is a symptom of a much broader, uh, he, I mean, we, this country elected Trump. Um, and uh, I think he just embodied uh, structural issues in the country and we should attend to those rather than trying to, to, uh, to say it was Trump because then Trump's gone now. So, well, I mean, his influence is not gone obviously, but those, those problems were there before and will endure afterwards. Our erosion of our investments in, in things that made us a world leader after World War II, um, that started way before uh, 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 the Trump presidency. Thank you. We have a question in the chat box from Ronnie Lipschitz ask, uh, asking or say, that my sense is that by following the science, we continue to expect scientists to tell us what to do, as in Fauci, in mm -hmm. order to somehow avoid political struggle. Could you talk about the politicization of science versus sciences 
as a product of politics and science as in sympiate theology as a natural law, so to speak? This is an excellent um, question. And it's something that I would love to talk about uh, much more. And I think it should be talked much more. This whole phrase politicization of science it gets us in trouble um, because it, it, okay, let me just say, the first thing I would say is that in general, our country is very inarticulate when it comes to science. We're impoverished in our language. So we have this one word, word we call it politics. And we, we have this, this thing, we've, we turn into a noun, politicization, and that describes everything that has to do with politics and science. So as soon as you, you there's something that when politics comes into science, it's supposed to then be, that's supposed to be bad. You know? But there's no way to avoid science being a part of politics. It is. We, there are choices we make about what we're gonna study and what we're not gonna study. If we just wanna use simple political science uh, uh, literature, interest groups affect that. Um, you know, and, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't trust science at all. Um, uh, the methods, but we need to find out, we need to figure out a different way to articulate why we should believe science. We should believe science because its methods are ones that we that that are good. The, the idea that we should verify things, that multiple people should 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 witness things, that we shouldn't just believe what anybody says, that we should have methods for trying to understand that, that we should collect data, all of that is good. That is not to say that it isn't also being shaped by political by the political sphere, but that should not be enough, enough to undermine our belief in science. But it is when we're not articulate about science and we don't have a way to talk about the way that there's no way to avoid a certain kind of political um, uh, uh, investment in the sciences. So going back to Fauci, the problem Fauci was in a very difficult position because you know, he was sort of down to did and down to didn't. So when, when he responded to Trump's claims, um, he still was parroting what Trump had to say. So he was, when he was talking about the bleach claim, um, you know, bleach, that claim about bleach ended up uh, um, taking over the blogosphere and things that we should have been paying attention to, like COVID is being transmitted in um, uh, meatpacking plants. That got far less of our attention. And Trump understood this. He knew how to work the system. Um, so I, I think that unfortunately, um, you know, we just don't have very good language to talk about how um, uh, the political realm intersects with science and why should we should believe science, even though it is political. But there's certain types of, we should not believe a science that comes from authoritarianism, which is sort of what we had with Trump. And we need to be able to distinguish between kinds of politics and kinds of politics that can work with science and we can still believe it, and kinds that we shouldn't, like an authoritarian rule that we were under when he, in, in the Trump regime. Another question that we have is from Ruth Firetag, who's asking, I'd like to hear more about how we learn to live with these viruses. I don't think COVID-19 will be the last virus we encounter. So how do we adjust practically and emotionally? That's a really wonderful question because of course that's that's the one that matters to us every day. How do we live with these viruses? Um, I think, you know, part of the challenge we have is that we spent so long ignoring what folks have been telling us, folks, ecologists, scientists have been telling us, you destroy the habitats and you destroy the habitats that the that that had created a, a system where you didn't have the spillover of these viruses. Um, um, to humans as, as much. It's not like you're ever gonna prevent that, but we certainly have accelerated it through factory farming, uh, through the destruction of habitat. So one thing is to decrease the amount of uh, meat you're eating, you know, coming from, from factory farming. It's not, it, it, that is a, a, a hub of producing not just virus spillover into the human species, but particularly virulent versions of viruses. This is something that Kate Brown, the point Kate Brown makes because the virus is now, you know, viruses want to live as well. They, they don't want to die. They want to coexist in their hosts, you know, but 
But if you're just like killing off their hosts right away, like the chickens, they have no investment in even trying to live very long. So like the virulent forms will persist. So I think we have to think ecologically about this problem. And, and you know, I, I know that William um, Walter Isaacson has just come out with his book. Um, I don't know how many would have heard the Terry Gross program last night talking about um, uh, what was the name of this, the, the book about Jennifer Doudna, who um, was, who was one of the discoverers, who won the Nobel Prize for the CRISPR technology that led to the mRNAs. And, and he was saying, look, you know, we've entered this new age. I don't think we have to worry about these viruses anymore because we can easily create vaccines. I think we need to interrogate that claim. Do we really want to be in a position where we have, an, we get, have a whole bunch of these and we have, then we have to go through this whole process of, of getting people vaccines with all the problems of trust that we've talked about? The, the, the technical capacity to make a vaccine doesn't mean that you have solved the problem of viruses and pandemics. So I think we need to invest and value other forms of knowledge. We need to not be waiting for biomedicine to save us. I think we need to be valuing other modes of knowing and other ways of existing, coexisting on this planet that doesn't involve targeting, cutting. Just think about the CRISPR metaphors. You know, you target, it's about individual, individualized medicine where you cut things out. That is not going to lead to a sustainable world. It is one tool in our toolbox, but we want to not have to use it very much. Thank you. The war analogy doesn't bring us close to the realization of, of um, the importance of, inter of the interdependence of species. Um, and how that has to happen, that realization and that coexistence in order for us to continue to survive these virus, these um, viral mutations as they occur. Um, Yael asks, would you say that part of this non-binary perception can and should be extended to people and nature and looking at them not as binary opposites, but as part of the same whole ever changing and moving be between identities. Absolutely, yeah, no. Um, um, that's exactly the kind of point that, that I'm trying to, to, to make, that we need a fundamental, and I, of course it's not just me. Um, you know, many of my colleagues um, also have been trying, you know, trying to help us reconceptualize. I mean, er, there's been a lot of work um, for decades, Emily Martin, Donna Haraway and others, who have talked about the problem of perceiving our immune system as in a battle. Like we have, um, you know, the virus invades us and then we attack it with our immune system. Um, and the problems of that mode of understanding, first of all, how it makes people feel psychologically when they lose, you know, are they then losers? You know, cause they lost, we talk about losing a battle with a disease. Well, that's also adding a psychological burden onto people at the same time that they're fighting quote unquote a disease, um, um, they, they, you know, it's like, did you do enough? You know, were you a strong enough uh, soldier in this, in this battle? Rather than not only not thinking about this as what do I do individually, but how do I change the society, the collective, how do we collectively change? Um, so no matter what disease we end up with, we end up feeling cared for. And, and this is often a point that I make, um, you know, I try to make um, with, with my, my colleagues um, who, are in the bio, who, are, who are in the healthcare professions, you know, that, that often what matters to a patient is, you know, that they feel cared for, that they feel like they're being seen, um, that they can trust their medical provider and you know, yes, we can we can we can hope for cures, but by but by basing your medical care on a hope for a future, that ignores what a patient has to do day in and day out, which is to get up in the morning and feel okay. And often that requires that they feel cared for. How do we create institutions, healthcare institutions that feel more caring for a broader and more uh, broader range of lives for more people. Um, I think that's really, um, you know, that's a doable, that's what we can do in the present. That's part of this broad now that Anna Frizz is talking about. That is possible in the present.
Faye Crosby asks, Jenny, or, or, or says, Jenny, thanks for a great talk. And Faye asks, how does your distrust of objective science differ from the distrust exhibited by Trumpers? No, I, I, Faye, thank you for the question. I want to distinguish, this is not my distrust. <laughs> um, I, what I've been talking about is uh, the, the data that we have coming out about um, uh, distrust uh, in, our, in our society. So, the, the, so all the numbers I'm giving you, I'm getting the vaccine just for the record. Um, I do trust it, I'm gonna go get it. Um, so why do others not trust it? Um, Trumper, to Trump, the Trump phenomenon is, is part of that. Um, the, the general questioning of institutions in this country. The problem this country, we say, we say we're founded on this notion of we the people. Well, who are those people anymore? What is the collective? And that's the crisis of this country, which is not just a political one, but a biomedical one, is that we don't have a people, you know, that anyone can govern anymore. And that's been made amply clear. And when you want to fight a pandemic, try fighting it when you when there's no pan, there's no, there's nothing that cuts across. It becomes very, very difficult. And that is a social political problem. Um, and Trump completely aggravated it. But again, I do not want to blame this on Trump because that's our desire as Americans, I think, to want to blame individuals uh, when really these are systemic problems that were decades, even centuries in the making. And that is what we, I hope this pandemic is a wake up call to that. And that the, the problems of trust that we've had getting people to trust this, this um, vaccine. And again, I wanna also note that we're not, it's not entirely clear whether or not the problems of, of the uptake of the vaccine, say in African-American communities is about trust or is it about access? And I think I wanna make that point as well. But the lack of access can feed into the problem of trust. So if, if and I know this, a, a, a good friend of mine um, is a leader of a labor union um, that represents healthcare workers. Um, and um, she was telling me about the problem of the trust of, of members of her union in the vaccine. And that was largely because they, the, the, the feeling was, well, the healthcare system doesn't care for us. Why should I believe that the vaccine, you know, all of a sudden when I couldn't get, you know, all of a sudden now I'm first in line when I've been last in line before. Um, that's, it's, it, these are the issues around, around trust. They're, they're not to do with a single individual. They're not to do with, yet yeah, Trumpism and that is a part of it if we understand it as an ism, as you put it, Faye. It, it is an ism, it isn't a Trump. And I, I, should, just, I, should, I should acknowledge that that's what you said. You didn't say Trump, you said Trumpism. Um, but I think we need to understand what's going on there that is deeper than just this moment of Trump, where it came from, and how that then plays out in the biomedical space. John Hall asks, what do you make of the ideological sources, multiple overlapping and convergent of the opponents of vaccines and or the opponents of masking? Yeah, okay. I was gonna talk about this. Um, yeah, I think there is overlap. Um, we have seen this in Santa Cruz. Uh, I was going to mention this, that the, the storming at the Trader Joe's, um, uh, folks coming to Trader Joe's and wanting to, to not wear masks. Um, uh, in Kansas, where I'm from, there's a lot of anti-maskers. It was seen as an act of war to be wearing a mask. Um, it was hard, very difficult coming from San Francisco and going to the middle of Kansas in the summer. Um, and it was quite a, a you know, I, I should, you know, I was not surprised, but it was a different world there. And I think it's similar, similar things that are leading to, to, and they're not entirely the, the same because that was not the same, but they're related. And that's why I wanted to break out the Republicans who were against the vaccine from African-Americans and say, there are multiple sources for the lack of trust, okay? One is coming from this, as I said, this, this, this culture of individualism and the culture wars. The idea that no one's going to tell me what to do. You know, I, I, this is a free land, but of course, who, who historically has been an individual in this country who has freedom? Well, for a long time, it was white male property owners. And over time, uh, a story that we teach in our Issues and Problems in American Society course, um, uh, uh, 
using a book by Eric Corner called The Story of American Freedom. Over time, we've struggled over that issue. We've, we've, we've fought over it with people in the country have said, no, you aren't living up to your, to your ideals of freedom. And we have expanded who counts as the we of this polity, but still too many are excluded from it. And the historic exclusions have led to an ongoing, um, um, well-grounded lack of trust in the government. But that is that, so they're connected in the sense that, you know, the, 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 the anti-maskers showing up at Trader Joe's who are, 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 are you know, saying it's my right, I'm an individual, um, that, that is connected to the, the problem of, of non-white people, um, um, you know, also mistrusting, because we're all part of the problem of being in a country where certain people had freedom and certain people didn't. And so there are well-ground reasons for why you wouldn't trust the government that didn't grant you basic rights of freedom. And then there are people who feel like, wait a second, um, whiteness is my property. There's this notion that, that, you know, that, that um, um, it's been developed in the social sciences and critical theory, this notion of whiteness as a property. You know, it's my right to, to be white and to be able to do what I want. Don't take that right away from me. Um, and so though I think those two things are connected, but we need to think carefully and not just lump everything together because then I think we miss the particularity of what's going on and why we're seeing what we're seeing um, in, in, at Trader Joe's in Santa Cruz, for example, and in our backyard. Angela Reed asks, Angelina Reed asks, I've been hearing about debates over ending unpaid and low pay internships to promote equity and diversity. What are your thoughts on this? Ending unpaid and low paid, um, what was it? Internships. In internships. Yeah, okay. Um, I've, I, I don't know if this is, will be related to what you're talking about. Um, there, I think there's a, there's, there's a focus on um, the issue of labor and how labor enters, who, who is doing the work um, of, of uh, for example, addressing systemic racism in our universities. Um, and, and so issues of labor and of class are intersecting with issues of race and racism in this moment. Um, and I think that they're all, I think the question is who is at the table making those decisions about, um, you know, I was making this point earlier that I, I've heard some of my colleagues say, you know, we're not gonna ask our grad students to do this because it's labor. And um, yeah, it might serve, we might, we want to know what they think about, you know, equity and justice, but, but, but also what place are we to ask them to do that labor? Um, but, but that, we, we can't have these, I think, uh, there needs to be more of a conversation, more of a, more of a, a, a built solidarity um, from faculty to students, to staff, to leadership of the university. Um, so that we're not presuming what other people think would be right and just, um, that we're having the hard conversations and asking ourselves, does it count as a move towards justice to get rid of these internships that are unpaid? How do we make that decision? Who's at the table making those decisions? Um, I think a lot of us are scared to do the wrong thing in this moment. And so we start taking things off the table. Um, so the, the question is, how do we create a robust space in which we can have these difficult conversations in a condition of lack of trust, which you know, we face as members of the university community where our grad students have been underpaid um, and, uh, and where the cost of attending our university has gone and up and up. Um, and so who, there's, a, there's a lack of trust amongst many people who it is the university serve. So how do we have a, a fair, trusted conversation under those conditions? It means we have to address those structural issues because without that, it doesn't matter what individuals do, how well-meaning I might be as your professor. Right? I'm, still, I'm still part of a system that I can't by myself change. Um, and I think that's really you know, the, hard, the hard, hard, hard questions that face us. Yep, we have time for one last question. Um, Hiroshi Fukurai 
question, his question entails how the political system influences the way sciences are taken seriously. For example, many socialist oriented countries are doing much better in dealing with the pandemic. Vietnam with 100 million, with a population of 100 million, for example, has only had 35 deaths so far. Mm -hmm. So does Laos and other socialist oriented countries in Asia. Mm -hmm. Similarly, socialist countries in the Western hemisphere, such as Bolivia and Venezuela, despite US economic and trade sanctions to, to both countries, are doing much better than other countries in Latin America. Can you say something about how the polity influences the way in which sciences are reflected in public health policies? Great question, Hiroshi. Yes, um, the United States has not been the shining star of this pandemic. And uh, I think our, we've shown that our political system is uniquely uh, ill-equipped to deal with a pandemic. Uh, it turns out that hypercapitalist mo mode of governing does not serve you well in a pandemic. And other countries that have much stronger um, histories of socialism, um, as you put it, socialist oriented countries have done so much better um, in this pandemic. Now, we hit a hard, we hit a hard issue when it comes, this goes back to your original question, James, when it comes to China, um, you know, there was, you know, there are still questions about what the trade-offs are between human rights um, and, uh, you know, when, when does socialism become authoritarianism and we then end up in, in questions about human rights? Those are hard questions. But certainly we are seeing the ways, as you point out, Hiroshi, in ways in which different polities and their modes of governing um, are going to play out differently in the public health space and, list, and, and lead to different outcomes. Um, a, a countries that had test and trace capacity and we were used to surveilling their populations did a lot better in this pandemic than countries like the US where there's a, there's a lack of trust in the government testing anybody. Um, and there's the good and the bad of that. Um, these are complex issues. So there's no good, bad here. You know, um, when E.P. Thompson was writing about moral economies, he was very clear to say that this is not evaluative. I'm just describing. And I think we could say the same here, that what we're just, we are describing something, whether or not we think it is right or wrong, and it's gonna depend on what our collective values and goals and orientations are. Um, and, and that is the, the deeper discussion that I think we need to have. And um, that deeper discussion is what's gonna lead, I think, to the cultivation of more trust in what we have to say about um, about viruses and, and about uh, vaccines and, and the things that we feel we need to end the pandemic. Thank you, Jenny, for a wonderful, wonderful conversation. It gives thank us much you. to think about and much to act upon. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Please join us on April 21st for our next university forum the filmmaker's voice in changing media landscape with filmmakers, assistant professor Jackie Olive and associate professor Jennifer Taylor. Please join me in thanking Jenny Reardon. And I wish all of you, we wish all of you a very good night.